This is the 17th season of Bass Talk Live. With your host, Mark Jeffries and Matt Pangrak. BTL is brought to you by Lawrence, Bass Cat Boats, Apco, Duck and Fishing, Strike King Lures, Sunline, Big Bite Baits, Spro, Exo Lures, Yamagatsu, The Bass Tank, and Denali Rod. PTL coming at you. Good Wednesday, everybody. Welcome once again to another edition of BTL Bass Talk Live, where Matt and I are going to talk bass fishing and anything else that we want to talk about. Matthew, how you doing? Excited for today's show. We got Hackney on, and Hackney always brings it. <laughs> Does he not? <laughs> that sounds like uh, a commercial for the monster trucks or something dude he always always has some good stuff when he's on btl <laughs> i'm excited for greg hackney all right that's good stuff it's been a while yeah it has been a while uh first thing i want to do you know yesterday we were supposed to have trevor mckinney on and uh he had a situation with a guide uh trip that he does he guides for canadian geese ducks mm-hmm. and all that and everything and the dude fell really bad He's, he kept texting me. and It's all I, good. You got to make I money. I told him, I go, dude, we'll get you rebooked. Don't worry about it. Anyway, I tried to load this picture, but it's in some weird format that I've never even seen before. It's a lot of geese on the ground. Anyway, I showed that to you. Goose, geese, geeses? Canadian geese. You can't really see it. Anyway, looks like a very happy customer. Mm-hmm. I would imagine that that's, that's got to be a pretty short season, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, it's not like I, a I have no eight, idea, eight or nine month season of goose hunting. No, I have I have no idea. If he's one of those bird guys, which no we've idea. talked about the bird guys, they go nuts when you can I know. shoot the birds for a month or two. I have no idea, dude. Uh, got nothing against it. I think it's cool. You know, the whole Canadian geese thing, I see them down by Chick-fil-A all the time. <laughs> it just kind of freaks me out a little bit when people kill them. You know that pond that's right by... Chick Fil A, right down the road here. Yeah, yeah, they hang out there. Oh, all that's the time. not a pond. That's the the drainage it's ditch a flood behind control. it. That's the one. Remember when oh, they had true. the <laughs> ultimate? It was like on the on the Animal Planet. They had yeah. like the ultimate angler contest. It was like yeah. the uh, you vote people. It was like Survivor of Fishing. I don't think that's Drew, what it was called, but it, whatever. Yeah. Drew did a submission video and to show how. <laughs> versatile the truth was he noodled in a flood control we went to that flood control canal (laughs) and he he fly fished in it and we're talking about like there's a mall on one side a chick-fil-a on another a car place i mean it's a it's not clear water it's i mean pretty disgusting so he he fly fished in there's no fish in it he fly fished in it he bass fished in it and he noodled so he was, was so bad. shirtless and noodling in this <laughs> kind People of were looking at him. semi-raw sewage retaining pond. They were all the at geese. lunch, and they were like, what the hell is this guy doing? Yeah, no, that was, that was wild. But uh, have you ever been chased by a goose, Mark? Oh, yeah, golf course. The golf course I grew yeah. up on, they would only hang out, and there's a pond on the, on the 17th hole. Mm-hmm. And about the 13th, and I'm 12, 13 years old, about the 13th hole, my mind would start wandering to the 17th hole (laughs) because these goose live to chase you yeah and i always walk mama goose oh yeah yeah just uh, protecting those eggs man way out yeah but i've never had one mess with me in a boat on the water it's always been in a parking lot or walking (laughs) i've always wondered why because you haven't been around where the eggs are but why but they've got their babies with them they got babies Ah. up there why do the geese not jack with bass fishermen but if you get around them with the babies or the eggs or anything on the wall. Now you'll see them, just, you know, like if, if they, they're on a nest. <laughs> what but was that again? <laughs> that's what they sound like. They get their neck way out, and then you're like, okay, 
I mean, I don't think uh, they have teeth, but they got to hold on to something. So maybe they've got little bitty razor things. That, I mean, I don't want to find out. Yeah. I don't know. But I why do they tell. not attack the boats? They has feel anybody safe in been, the water. Has anybody gotten attacked by a goose while you're going down the bank with a trolling motor? Not just yelled at by I've a goose, but attacked. I've never even seen that. No? Haven't seen that. Haven't heard of that. I got one more goose story if we want to go there. It's real quick, though. <laughs> I'm on. Is it? I'm on Texoma last couple springs ago. And I'm fishing this one dock, and it's got a, a real nice ski boat in it that's got a cover on it. Yeah. And, uh, and I hear, <laughs> and I'm not sure what it is, but there's a goose sitting around. There's a couple geese, a pair of geese. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, maybe there's bad. I don't know. So the car pulls up, and I'm flipping a jig around the dock, and the guy walks down on the dock, and I just hear him go, crap. <laughs> and I'm like, everything okay, dude? And he goes, not really. They hatched. Oh, and I really? said, what? And he said, yeah. He said, the wife wanted to go out in the boat, and I came down a couple days ago, and there was a nest with eggs. And he had a broom and stuff. He's like, I was going to clean it off. He's Ooh. like, we can't take the boat out now. He's like, I can't. He's like, I don't know what to do. He's like, I'm a, he's like what, would, what do you do? He's like, now there's babies there. He's like, I can't just. Yeah, that's a good point. So he was boatless for he said he's, he said he'd give him two weeks. I don't know whatever happened. He's like, I guess we won't take the boat out for two weeks. Man, that would suck. Yeah, walked out a goose family in his boat. Yeah, he did the right thing though. And he'd go out for a couple weeks, did he? A ton of people have gotten attacked by a goose. Yeah, geese are violent. Gregory Hall says. Hackney just grabs him by the neck, just <laughs> walks him back, looks him in the eye. You can says, ask him if he's ever been says, attacked. Stop it, goose. And the goose is like, okay. By goose. Anyway. All right, man. News-wise, the field for the Elite Series was announced. No surprises at all, except no. the missing name that I thought would be on there. Who is that? Mike Iganelli. Yeah. I had, uh, had a little inside info on that, and... Uh, didn't know for sure, but thought that his name was not going to appear on the list. Hence, it did well, you not. you had the inside. Obviously, we got Justin Atkins, Greg yeah. Hackney, who we're having on today, Jason Christie. Yeah. Uh, and then all the open guys accepted, and the Bass Nation guy accepted. Yeah. So you're down to 101 anglers this year. Yeah. Should be pretty entertaining. Obviously. Good stuff. Uh, M. Irfan. Mm -hmm. knew that there would be a lot of money spent on the Elite Series. So underneath the list, just let everyone know that her mother's neighbor is working part-time and averaging $9,000 a month. And all you do is click on the link, so if you need to make any money. <laughs> okay. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items real quick. I want to let everybody know that I am working with the PR agency that represents White River Marine to try and get an interview with somebody. But as of yesterday afternoon, I still do not have a response. And there have been some ginormous names that are no longer in a Ranger. Ranger Scott or, Martin. Yeah. Jason Christie. Yeah. yeah. Jared Lintner. Yes. That's just off the top of my head. So I am going to follow up with them today. I will follow up with them every day. Until I finally get an answer here, okay, here's a date, let's do this, or we are declining this opportunity for an interview. And whatever the outcome is on that, I will let you guys know. Uh, the second thing, I'm a little delayed on getting the form out for the free reimbursement of the 2021 Marshall two entries that I'm going to give away. Uh, hopefully this afternoon I will have that on BassZone.com. So just keep posting on that. I responded to a ton of emails about that. Uh, it will be posted either today or tomorrow. I thought it was going to be out there yesterday, dude, but I got uh, tied up in live streaming three and a half hours of high school wrestling. Grappling. Interesting. Yeah. It is interesting. My cousin was a big time. Especially wrestler. in the in the COVID era right now. I mean, these guys are... What, do they just get tested before the match? I, I don't know. I'm not really sure. But it's funny because they will grapple and just 
get all over each other, and then when they're go done, put a mask on. Yeah, afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know how much sense that makes, but that's what happens. It's kind of funny. Uh, so that form uh, will be out there shortly, and uh, I'm going to give away a couple of free Marshall entries. Obviously, hopefully, you have entered, and then we'll get you on BTL to do that. Uh, 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 ask this, because what Ike's. You think Ike's decision not to fish the Elite Series was his decision? Oh, yeah. 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 yeah he wasn't forced into not fishing. Yeah, exactly. Right. He's working on some stuff. We'll see. Yeah. I would say that when he's... When is he not working on some stuff? <laughs> Good point. He's going to be 50 pretty soon, dude. He's building a sock empire right now. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. He has on signature Did he have Christmas socks? socks? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. He was actually talked about him when he was on here. There's like slow mo videos of him putting socks oh, on. Yeah, if you're right. into that type yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Uh, geez. <laughs> I'm just saying. It's, it's wow, out there. Wow, hanger. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine? Do you imagine like 1985, George Cockard coming on in a commercial? I'm, I'm Elite Series or Bassmaster champion, George Cockard. Try my socks. <laughs> <laughs> I, the David Fritz cranking socks. He had shoes. Or no, that was Woo Dave's that had the shoes. The fishing shoes. Mm -hmm. That was Woo Dave's. That was was ahead of his time. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, Last thing I want to mention, and then we'll take a break and come back with Mr. Hackney. Once again, dude, what do I love when it comes to television or movies or whatever? What do I love? Documentaries. The documentaries. And there was another amazing documentary on HBO. Have you heard about this one? It actually has some fishing ties. Kind of, but not really. It's called Alabama Snake Man. Never heard of it. Dude, you got to check this out. This was a true story. Is this the Tiger King of Alabama? Uh, it was from... Uh, <laughs> Are we off the hook, Mark? Do you, do you know where Scottsboro is? Yeah, Scottsboro Tackle. It's not very far from Gunnersville, right? Yeah, no, I go to Scottsboro Tackle all yeah. the time. I think it was 1991 uh, when this dude was accused of murdering his wife uh, by a rattlesnake. Have you not heard about this? No. I, I, I was fascinated by this whole stuff. And, and some of the people that they interviewed, unbelievable. If you have not seen this, folks, you need to check it out. It's on HBO. It's called Alabama Snake Man. It kind of gave me the creeps a little bit. Yeah, that would give me the creeps. It, it, it was, there was some bizarre stuff in this documentary. Uh, it was one of those uh, preachers, oh, reverends, yeah, or whatever yeah, yeah. you call where they, with, they speak in, or they uh, handle the snakes. Yeah. Yeah. And they're all rattlesnakes. Yeah, dude. no, I am not going to that church. <laughs> I'm out. But uh, she got rushed to the hospital anyway. They didn't have. Anti-venom. Yeah. So they had to get her to Birmingham, and as they pull out, they show a sign, and it says Gunnersville, 20 miles. Do you know? right there. I was thinking, Hackney's got to have had some snake stories. Oh, well, ask him. I would think so. I would venture to say out of everybody who's tangled with him, he's probably tangled the most, because I don't think he would see a snake and leave it alone. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> yeah. No. I think he'd leave it alone. He wouldn't mess with it. I think he would. No, I disagree with you. I think he'd mess with it. He may say, shoo, shoo, get away. It wouldn't surprise me if he's been bitten by a poisonous snake, <laughs> no! sucked the venom out himself, and then continued on his hunt. Uh, now, you know what they did in the old days? Back you, in the day. You cut an X, and then you suck the venom out. Yeah, and then you put tobacco in there. I had a snake kid as a little kid. And it had like a little razor in it and like this little thing that you would crack open and I yeah. would always carry it with me in central Illinois where there are no poisonous snakes. Yeah. Just yeah. in case a water snake got yeah. hold of it. That, that is one of the worst things that I hate in the month of May and June yeah. is fishing boat docks because the water moccasins yeah. and all the snakes get around those docks, especially at Grand Lake. You fall is really bad too. Apparently, based on this, the feedback, the, the, the swans are the worst thing. Have you ever tangled with one of them no. or, ornamental swans? No, they're beautiful, man. Apparently, they are <laughs> ill-tempered. <laughs> they get pissed off, huh? 
They are ill-tempered. Have you ever had they are a... Tommy Biffle in a crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had a tussle with a swan there, Matthew? Huh? Ever? Uh-uh. I don't, you know, I don't see them that much. How about but cranes? I would imagine there got to be more swans in those high-rent lakes. Cranes. Uh, Ever gotten in a tussle with a crane? Like the ribeye of the sky? Yeah. <laughs> no, the only time I've ever seen the cranes are on the side of the highways in Florida. Really? Yeah, remember you're driving down and you see those dang cranes just on the side? Yeah. I've only seen a couple flocks of the... Uh, now, what's those things that are... Oh, what about a, a blue heron? Yeah, yeah, I think every... Yeah. The worst, and I don't understand why, is 99% of the time the blue herons leave your stuff alone, but every once in a while you will get a blue heron that will not leave your top water alone. Oh, I've had that happen a zillion times. The other ones, it's the worst when you don't see them, and then you make just a bomb cast with a spook on braid, <laughs> not and then good. you've got that, that time where you're like trajectory, blue heron trajectory, and you're like, no, 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 and then they... Yeah. You know what's weird though? I have found you a loon must be the smartest or most intelligent water animal out of all of them. You think? Because you can fish around loons. You can cast through loons with treble hooked lures. You can have very realistic looking baits around loons. They're diving. You're seeing yeah. them on the 2D, on the forward facing sonar technology, and they never get tangled in the line. You know what the dumbest bird is? The gulls. They're pretty stupid. Or they're opportunistic. <laughs> no, they're pretty stupid. All right. By the way, Binkwood on the instant feedback said that Hackney probably eats snakes. What do you think? You I'm think sure he's, he's ever had rattlesnakes? Sure yeah, I've tried it. I've tried it. Have you not tried it? Never. I've tried oh, no banded water snake before. The thing was moving while I was picking the ah! cooked meat off of it. That's a true story. No, we'll find out. I want to hear Silka. more about this. We caught it off the swim beach. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a break. Come back with Greg Hackney here on a Wednesday. Don't forget, day four tomorrow, Frank Scalish. Can't wait to see what he has. We'll be right back. Everybody stay tuned. exceeded any and all expectations I had. It really opened up my eyes to things that I never knew happened. I'm not sure what kind of voodoo uh, they've included in the software, but it's, but it's incredibly impressive. He was messing around, just picked a little crappie jig in there, and all of a sudden you see the jig come right down in there, and you see the fish come to it. I mean, it was like that. It's just a complete different universe that we're taking this fish into. There's no bass safe out there. Active Target by Lowrance. Game on. BassCat's legendary 20-foot platform has been paired with Angler-approved accessories for 2021. Puma FTD features the proven hull used by many of the top names in bass fishing today, backed by a transferable lifetime warranty. The Puma FTD boasts a full team deck concept which enhances efficiency for you and your tournament partners. Turnkey tournament winning performance. The Puma FTD SP from BassCat. Inspired, pro designed, tested and proven by legends on the water, dominating the tournament trail for over 50 years. Everything you need, one legendary brand. Strike King. Hey guys, Major League Fishing Pro Jacob Wheeler here with my new Signature Series line of rods with Ducket Fishing. We have my 7.2 cranking rod right here. Crankbaits can be very fickle and having the right, you know, having a lot of tip can be too much and having not enough tip can, you know, lose a lot of fish. So you really got to be careful. If there's one or two techniques that I'm really, really adamant about having the perfect action is a crankbait, especially like a square bill, a DT6. Um, you know, those medium running crankbaits in the springtime, when those fish's mouth are pretty tough, that's when I'm really, really, really on top of having my actions just perfect.
While I travel the country on the Bassmaster Elite Series, I simply can't let the weather be the reason I don't win $100,000. That's why I use AFCO clothing to keep me warm, dry, and protected from whatever Mother Nature wants to throw at me. My season depends on it. My career depends on it. AFCO. Any fish, any water. Hey everyone, Brandon Polnick here. People always be asking me what I got tied on. I'm like, X-Zone Lures. And they're like, Brandon, why you got X-Zone Lures tied on? And I'm like, let me show you why. The bite. Get down there. Get down there. Oh, yeah. Where's it going? Oh, it's freaking Get in here. Oh, God. Giant. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I think you get the point. Big companies get bigger and bigger and talk about their fancy labs where they study fish behavior. But then they all go golfing on the weekend. We don't have a large laboratory to test baits. Why, you ask? We don't need a big laboratory because our pros fish, our employees fish, our salespeople fish, our suppliers fish, our mold builders fish, our owners fish, and our kids fish. This is our laboratory. Our R&D comes from time on the water, learning how to make fish bite. All that time on the water brings us thousands of hours of testing new products and improving current ones for all species. All of us on the Pro Tournament Trail use Gamigatsu hooks. Why? Because they are absolutely the best. It's not about how many bites you get, it's how many you put in the boat. Gamakatsu makes hooks for every fishing style. We didn't come this far to lose fish. Did you? For more information, visit gamakatsu.com. Let's face it, fishing electronics are no longer an afterthought. They've become a necessity. And at the Bass Tank, our experts match you with the right electronics, provide professional installation, and educate you to help maximize your catching results while providing support along the way. <laughs> because let's be honest, it's about catching, not just fishing. And when you're ready for better results, join the Bass Tank team. Visit us today on Facebook or go to thebasstank.com. You've been waiting all week for this. And Sunline wants to make sure you're ready for it with bulk spools of all your favorite fishing lines. Oh, it's so fun. Bulk up with Sunline. All right, we are back on a Wednesday. Mark and Matt in studio. It's time to go to our special guest. And uh, I was surprised on the instant feedback. A lot of people have had snake. A lot of people have been attacked by a lot of angry things that live in the wild. <laughs> Goose, snake. Yeah. All right, let's do this. Let's uh, bring in Greg now. Greg, you there, man? Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, we got you, man. Thanks for I, uh, uh, I'm, joining I'm the a show. i technical difficulty. I don't know what has happened, but. I was getting a little background noise. All right, you good now? Yeah, I'm good now. All right, very nice, man. Thanks for taking time out. Uh, we always appreciate you coming on the show. And and right out of the gate, man, a lot of people want to know, have you ever been attacked by a goose or a snake? I've never been bitten by a snake. I've ate snake. I've caught hundreds of snakes. <laughs> I have told a you. Lot of time with snakes. <laughs> if you pass a snake, do you mess with it? Uh, not as much as I once did. Uh, I'm always tempted. What's the most dangerous snake you've ever you've ever messed with? <laughs> uh, say that. Repeat that one more time. Uh oh. Mo most dangerous snake you've ever messed with? Uh, I guess a cottonmouth. You know, that's about the only snake that I do have the utmost respect for that I know will bite you. I don't have much fear of a rattlesnake. 
especially the rattlesnakes in our area, they're timber rattlers and uh, they're real docile. I mean, I don't know how you would make one bite you, honestly. Like for people to get bit <laughs> by a snake, I, it, I can tell you, I, I, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but I, I don't know how they do that. Because like I said, I spent a lot of time messing with snakes and have never come close to getting bit. What about geese and swans, birds attacked from above? Uh, probably an owl is the coolest thing. Tried to get my popper once upon a time. That's probably the coolest bird I've ever had to try to get one of my lures. An owl. A great yeah, horned cool. owl. Yeah. All right, Greg, here's what we're going to do. Uh, I think this will fix it. Uh, we're going to we're gonna let you go and then close it out and then click on the link again, and I'll bring you back in. Okay. Okay, I'll do that. All right. Sounds Sorry. good. All right. We're going to. It was doable. It redo. just wasn't crisp. Yeah. Does it? It does it kind of load or something when he's in the when the guys are in the queue for a long time. Sometimes kinda, there's some sort of weird lag deal that goes on. Yeah. Sometimes. So we'll we'll get him back here in just a few minutes. Uh, a lot of good suggestions have come in for what Frank needs to do on his day four shows, and right. probably the largest or most requested element was a rogue show and i know he's working on that that's not what the show is going to be uh tomorrow but there is definitely going to be a rogue show coming up with uh day four all right let's see here i see him pop back up yeah let's see if this is we'll see better if this works all right greg you there is that better we're gonna let the stream uh, settle down first yeah it's a uh, it's a little better i actually updated my phone this morning because it was supposed to fix this problem, but undoubtedly... Yeah. The, the, oh, no. Now the government not. knows where you are, Greg. <laughs> no, that's that's right. why you never update your phone. I'm still on an original iPhone. <laughs> Jeez. Hey, what is <laughs> what is the photo that's behind you? Uh, that's a picture of me fishing at uh, the St. John's River. Any me memory on that? or uh, I mean, what's the significance of it? It looks pretty cool. Uh, it's a cool photo. It's... Uh, I think it was on the final day. I can't remember what year. I can't remember what year it was, but it was on the final day. Somebody took that uh, photo. Actually, Phoenix Boat sent me that picture. They, yeah. uh, they took that uh, picture and sent it to me, and I, you know, I, they had framed it as it was as a gift. So uh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Are you a are you a memorabilia kind of guy? In other words, all the stuff that you have accomplished in this sport. Have you kept like the the FLW Cup winning rod and reel or bait or any of that stuff? Do you hang on to memorabilia that that you've had success and earned victories over the years? Um, no, not 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 really. That's not really me. I you know, yeah, I might still be using the rod that I won with. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good, you know. A, a, a lot of guys out there. I know we spoke with uh, with uh, Defoe, and and he was kind of into that a little bit about keeping some of the stuff just from a memory standpoint uh, after he won the Bassmaster Classic and stuff like that. Anyway, Greg, uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about twenty one. Uh, what really is your your? I don't want to say attitude, but Man, you've done so much in this game, and and now you're back in the Elite Series. What is really your goals and objectives going into this season? Uh, you know, my, my main objective is to get back to the Bassmaster Classic. Uh, I mean, you always have that. That's always my has always been my entire career. You know, while fishing Bassmaster, that was the number one, and then Angler of the Year is always something. But you always got to wait on that and kind of see how the year goes. But uh, mentally, I'm preparing. You know, I want to go back to the classic. Uh, you know, honestly, it's the only title in the sport that has eluded me, and uh, that was that's my main objective. I I will be honest with you; it kind of gives me that feeling this year of starting my career over. That sounds funny, but I uh, I probably don't. Ha I have jitters. You know, might, probably not to the extent that Christy does. You know, I I noticed he posted <laughs> yesterday. He was an absolute disaster right now. You know, but uh, how's he ever going to catch always, one? <laughs> Yeah, how's he ever going to catch one? You know, poor Jason Christie. Uh, I, think about this. Now, this is a guy that says he's nervous, and his nickname is the most dangerous guy in bass fishing. <laughs> and I'm like, he's nervous. We should all be terrified. You know what I mean? But, wow. uh, 
but it is it's cool I, i'm really looking forward to this season uh i think it's gonna be tough to be honest with you just the way things are lining up and depending on weather and the places we're going i i don't expect for it to be easy i expect for it to be a tough season some of the places they're going i've been before some i've not and then some i've not been in years so uh it'll, it's gonna be an interesting season to say the least all right. I I remember uh, a couple years ago at the Bassmaster Classic. Uh, obviously, I think it was when was it? It was the last one. Where was that one at? Birmingham. The la- like last year. Or yeah. The one that Hank Cherry won. Yeah, yeah that, that was, was on Birmingham. Lake Gunners. Yeah. Okay, I remember talking to you there, Greg. You were in the Academy booth, Academy Sports and Outdoors. And one of the things that you said to me, you looked right at me and you said, man, I have been waiting a long, long time for a deal like this. And, and this opportunity that you have working with Academy uh, Sports and Outdoors. Uh, from a business perspective, dude, you're one of the superstars in the sport. I was a little bit surprised when you said that to me because I would think that it would be a little bit more easier for you being one of the superstars in the game to land a big deal like that. But kind of talk a little bit about what the process was like in getting that deal done, because I do realize after talking to you how important that deal was, as is every single deal that you have. But it just seems like that you were uh, you were just kind of giddy because you got that one single deal. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh yeah i mean you know the deal is our industry sponsorship is harder now than it's ever been before there there are multiple reasons for that you know a lot of it is the sport's bigger than it's ever been before so there's a lot of people out there asking or needing that and um you know that academy deal for me was a godsend i in that you know it really didn't have that much to do with me as it did the companies that i was already aligned with helped that Help me get that deal, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, the, the cool thing about me being at Academy, I, I even tell the, you know, the people at Academy this Academy was the place that I shopped <laughs> forever because their prices are so good. So it was kind of a cool fit for me in that, like Academy kept my children in hunting clothes for the last 15 <laughs> years in that because their prices are so good and I got so many kids and needed to clothe them. <laughs> So, uh, but like, it's just kind of a perfect match, if that makes sense. Like, cause I'm that guy that shops at Academy. So I just love to advertise for them. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's been an opportunity for us to run some, you know, some, a lot of hack attack stuff through Academy. And, uh, again, it's, it's, it's a huge deal for them to be, you know, they're the official sponsor of the Bassmaster Classic. They're just, they support our industry. You know, they support our business and what we do every day. And, uh, it was a it, it was a huge deal for me and those types of deals don't I, you know i've been fishing professionally now for 20 years and um mm-hmm. uh, those deals are hard to come by you know like if you drive past out there go ahead sorry i have a question continue i'll ask it afterwards it'll still be applicable <laughs> uh well you know the deal is there are a lot of great anglers out there that and only a handful of those deals out there so uh you know for me to get one of those you know I was very fortunate for that to happen. Right place, right time. I've had a, you know, I've had a good career, and uh, you know, it's one of those deals. I just feel like I've worked a long time to get this opportunity, and I'm glad to have it. And I definitely don't take it for granted. Yeah, well deserved. All right, Matthew. Oh, along those lines, I mean, I, could if you go like pass an academy? I mean, you're an academy guy. There's a couple of those. Can you just like go in and get all the stuff you want, and then you have like a Greg Hackney card, and you just like show it to the associate, and they're like, "Thanks, Greg," and then you just like roll out. Uh, yes, I actually have two. One is Mastercard, and one is Visa. <laughs> and they both have my name on them. I just wondered. That was. I know it sounds like a smart ass question, but that was a legitimate question. I didn't know. I mean, like, if there's, like, three of these, like, you and Jacob Wheeler have them, and you get, like, your, like, I mean, then they're like, who's that? And then you're like, hey, you see that, like, billboard over there, the sporting goods? And they're like, oh, yeah, Greg. And then you show them your, your secret card, and then you just walk out with bags of Academy stuff. Yeah, yeah. I do not that. how it I works? Buy gas with, I buy gas with that same card. <laughs> Apparently, that's not how it works. That's, <laughs> that's what I had in mind. I had in mind that you could just... <laughs> You yeah, basically it, had your own not, tackle store. It doesn't store. work that way. 
That's unfortunate. Yeah. It's a Greg Hackney Visa card. Yeah. You know, with his yeah. <laughs> boat and picture and everything else on there if you want it. All right, Greg. Uh, a lot of people on the instant feedback and on the comments, they want to know, and, and I don't know if you want to talk about it. If you do, great. If you don't, I understand. But a lot of people out there want to know, do you regret doing what you did for your career over the past three years, having been a part of MLF and now back with the Elite Series? Uh, no, I, I don't. I don't. I don't regret it. You know that was a that was a business decision for me to try that deal, and uh, you know what? It it wasn't for me, but I, I don't regret it. I mean, you know, you learn a lot from all your experiences in life, and you hope that the experiences that you experience make you better in the future. And uh, no, I don't regret it at all. You know, I I had been a part of Major League Fishing since the beginning. You mm-hmm. know, so for me to move over to the Bass Pro Tour and, and try that deal, I mean, you know, basically it made sense. You know, at the time it seemed like it did, and you know, I just don't feel like for me personally, it's 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 fine for a lot of guys over there. It wasn't quite what I had it expected it to be for me. So. Uh, you know what? I'm a I'm a five bass fisherman. I, I like to hold fish up at the weigh in. I like to see the crowds. Um, so you know what? I went back to home for me. You know, Bassmaster's been like home. That's where I started my career. Well, I started my career at FLW, and then I mm-hmm. went to Bass, and uh, so I've been everywhere. You know what I mean? I've tried it all, but you know, day in and day out, Bassmaster's the place I've just felt like was best for my family, best for my sponsors, and best for me personally. And uh, you know, I am a single entity business, <laughs> and so I have to do what's best for my business, and I felt like it was best for me to go back to Bass All right. Great answer. There you have <laughs> it, kind folks. Of speaking of that, you fished, fished the uh, Central Opens this past year, had a, a, a great year in the Central Opens. Jeffrey's cautioned me to go down this road. I'm going to go down it. I'll do it diplomatically as possible, okay. but I've got you right now, and i got to ask you this question because it's a cool story, and I want to know if there's any level of accuracy to it because you know how fishermen are. They kind of embellish. So I'm fishing. I fish a draw tournament, and I draw a kid who drew you on day one of the Arkansas River. You were leading the tournament by three pounds, had 18-1. Uh, I mean, everyone in, in Oklahoma kind of knows how that went down and stuff. And he's like, it was freaking unbelievable. He's like, we're just going to dip in here. And then, bam, he caught a four. And then, bam, he caught another four. And then we went a while. And then he looked at me and said, well, we're just staying here all day now. And uh, he said, at one point during that day, you're in an area that we're around all other boats. Like I said, this is his version of it. And he could have embellished it. This is what I want you to either confirm or to die. And, and a guy who was fishing the bank kind of started creeping in on you a little bit. And you said, hey, kind of cast over there just to kind of let that guy know not to come out. And you said, ah, this guy's coming out here because he's seeing me catching these big ones. And he said, at one point, you just kind of didn't really say anything. You're mellow. He said, you turned around and said, hey, put your life jacket on. And you idled over to the guy. And you just said, man, we can do this one of two ways. He said, you're obviously out here because I'm out here. You could either kind of get out of my area or you see that spot on the bank right over there. We can both go over there. And he said that, that the guy just, never, he said that, happen. he said that the guy was like, oh, uh, okay. And, and then he left and that, that you turned around and winked at him and said, I think I scared him a little bit. And then you went right back to catching four pounders. Is there any truth to that story at all? I won't tell you that there may be 50%. Okay. That I'm good with that. <laughs> <laughs> he said, and, and I even, he said, he said that you said there's two ways this is going to go down. Either you could, you could get out of here. Or there's a nice clean no, spot we that, can pull our boats up on. <laughs> no, 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 that never happened. Okay, like that. dang, I I'm disappointed now. Have a con- I, I, I did have a conversation with the guy, and I was a little bit. I was trying to intimidate him a little bit. I mean, and I am a professional angler, and uh, people intimidate in professional sports. So I did kind of do that, and uh, and then I turned around and. I did wink at my partner. And, uh, <laughs> yes! I said, I, 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 you know, so this is the deal. We we play a game on on a public body of water. I can't. I, I couldn't run the guy off. I did was maybe trying to intimidate him slightly, and uh, and I just went back and done my deal. <laughs> well, that kid was that kid was highly impressed with the minute with the move. He said, dude, he said it was so freaking awesome fishing with him that day. He's like, it would just, he'd just go an hour and then he'd catch a big one. Yeah, it was a, uh, yeah, that, I, I actually, that place I had had one bite in there in practice and it was almost a six pounder. 
and there were so many people in there in practice, I really couldn't practice. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to take a chance on it. We had about 45 minutes in there to fish before uh, before, I do, before I was going to lock down. So I said, well, I run in there and give it 30 minutes. If I catch one or two, you know, I felt like it was really good. I'll be honest with you. When I found it in practice, I thought I'd catch, I might catch over 20 pounds off of it. But uh, we rolled in there. I think I caught two big stripers on back-to-back casts and then almost a five-pounder. And I pretty much knew when I caught that one, I was like, yeah, we're probably not going. I think I had three for like 11 before they, the group locked down. And uh, that I was like, yeah, I'm going to stay. And then, uh, yeah, an not, you know, but decision. I stayed all day and only caught seven bass. Yeah, you know, I only st- caught seven. I think I never caught one after 1030. I had caught all seven of them by 1030 or 11, and I never caught another one. They were all offshore on some offshore rock piles. All right, Greg, you but mentioned it earlier. While, but I did it. I- I, I, I'm sure it was. I'll take the 50%. That's a great story. Yeah, that is a great story. Uh, Greg, you mentioned it earlier. You've been doing this game for over 20 years. And, and I'm curious, from the Greg Hackney 20 years ago to the Greg Hackney of today, what is Greg Hackney much, much better at in the game of professional bass fishing? Hmm. You know, probably now I... Uh... I'm just a lot more set in my ways. Like I probably don't get as uh, overcompensate as much as once I, I once did. You know what I mean? I kind of let things happen now. I guess that'd probably be the biggest thing now. I just like, you know, I let however my practices are. That's how the tournament's going to turn out. I don't try to force anything. I just kind of ride my deal. You know, now used to I would, I would have you know go out and practice and i'd be like you know during the tournament i'd be like well that i can't win doing that so i just do something off the wall during the tournament and try to make something else happen and i don't do that anymore now i just i go practice and i'm like you know what my practices are typically good enough i'll just ride it out and see what happens i probably let things happen more than trying to force them it's probably the biggest thing has changed hmm. what's the most finessey I was thinking about this the other day. What is the most finesse thing you've ever done in a tournament? Like, what's the lowest line, the most just super finessey thing that you've ever done in a in a professional tournament, in your opinion? I drop shot it. <laughs> but I mean, have you ever gone down I mean, to the five, the six pound test line, the four inch bait and oh, stuff? Oh yeah, lots. Oh yeah, lots. Now I'll be honest with you about that. Now, as far as competition with a spinning rod, I do that a lot. A lot more than people mm-hmm. think. I mean, I, my first win was with a shaky head. And uh, I never fish a tournament. I don't care if I got all braided out that I don't have a couple spinning rods rigged up. Typically with a – now, I will be honest with you. I've not gotten into the Ned rig deal. But I will. I am not afraid to use that. I just have not done that. Uh, but I always have drop shots rigged up, shaky heads. Uh, you know, I like a tube with on a jig head. You know, I always have that stuff as backup, and that stuff always spills into cracks. You can ne- hardly ever fish an event for four days that you won't need that sometime during the event. Very seldom can you ever ride that big rod the entire tournament. And, you know, that's one thing. That's another thing I have learned is that you can't force fish to do what you want them to. you got to let them tell you. You know, they, they tell you what they want to do, and uh, you won't survive in this career, career without being, being versatile and being able to do everything. There's no way I could have gotten to the point where I'm at without, you know, if I'd have said, well, I'm not going to fish with a spinning rod. That don't have, I actually enjoy to fish with a spinning rod uh, as long as I can catch big ones. Now, that's the only drawback that I have with a spinning rod. I don't like to catch rats on a spinning rod. When I got a spinning rod out, I'm still targeting the same size fish that I would have if I was had a flipping stick out. I will say that is kind of my Achilles heel. If it comes to a deal where I got to catch one pounders on a spinning rod, I just won't hardly do it. Well, that didn't. That's wow. not. Uh, that doesn't work out very good based on the last couple <laughs> years. <laughs> now it's all starting to make sense. <laughs> all right. A, a a thing on this show, Greg, is we get into these conversations about some of the old school techniques, and one of the things that always comes up is the pork trailer. Can you remember the last time that you caught a bass on a pork trailer? Yeah, it's it's probably been 15 years ago. Used to, I would eat, I would like, I, you know, just like everybody else, I use pork all the time. And then our, our plastic trailers got so good, I would use plastic during the 
summertime and then I still threw pork during the wintertime and then it just got to be, you know, it's just so much easier to use the plastic trailers and they come scented, you know, and, uh, but I, I was a huge fan of pork and I caught lots of big fish using a pork trailer. You know, pork had such great action, but our plastic now is so good and scented and you don't have to deal with that liquid and it drying out. And, but it's probably been 15 years and I don't own a piece of pork anymore. I, I can't believe I haven't even run up on any in my shop. I, I never, uh, I, I couldn't even tell you the last time I saw a jar of pork. Wow. I thought it might be a little bit closer to like he had a secret jar so, yeah. that he keeps in his, <laughs> that he keeps in a compartment in his boat. Yeah. You know, Hey, I'm Just pulling out the pork. I'm going to the, the pork. Uncle Josh every now and then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, you know, is Uncle Josh still in business? I think they just came. I think. I don't we, know. So we talked about this a couple months ago, and I think someone sent me some stuff that they're like making a comeback. They're kind of like uh, Bill Bottoms. <laughs> like the pork is is gonna make a comeback. Bell just bottoms. Like, uh, yeah, just like all the styles. You know what I mean? No, I'm not into the whole style thing. I mean, wasn't that big back in the day? Like you know, the the, the show off the thighs, but then you have boom, big. Uh, whatever, Panger. No, I have no Big idea what you're on the talking bottom. about. <laughs> hey, wanna... Style is cyclical. Baits are cyclical. Look at, look, everything is cyclical in the fishing. Like, think about it. Like, it was like, oh, remember five, six years ago we were talking about, oh, no one throws a spinnerbait anymore. Now everyone throws a spinnerbait. Yeah. I mean, everything is cyclical. What goes around comes around. Would right? you not agree on that? I mean, do you have you found that stuff I, that I you started with that. fishing with, now everyone's like, oh, check out this new thing, and you're like, dude, I, I was doing that stuff like back in the day. Yeah, it is funny about the spinnerbait deal. I think that people quit throwing them long enough that fish forgot what it was. Now they're like, "Wow, what is that with those shiny <laughs> bleeds on it?" Mm -hmm. It happened with the with the with the uh, chatterbait too. It just it burned out quicker. So I mean, that was oh five oh six, and it was hot for like five or six years. And then there was a period of time where it wasn't like, "Oh, chatterbait, 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 chatterbait." And then the last three or four years, it came back around again. Yeah. I mean, do you believe that year classes of fish that you have? You have year classes of fish or, or generations of fish that get conditioned to it, and then people stop throwing it, and then now you're two or three generations of fish down, and now it's like a new bait to them again? Yeah, there's not too many new baits to the fish out there. Our fish get fished for a lot now. I, most of the ones I'm around seem to be fairly educated. <laughs> but but what I'm saying is, do you think like uh, if a is a ch do you think a chatterbait would work better if no one threw a chatterbait for the next five years, like a fish no never felt that vibration? No no doubt in my mind, if everybody quit throwing it five years from now, you picked it up, it would be the only thing to throw. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. I I will be honest with you about a bladed jig. I feel like our group has trained the world on a bladed jig. In that, if you watch, I don't care if it's Bassmaster, Major League Fishing, or what you're watching, somebody has one in their hands 24/7. Like it's kind of a, it's kind of like a lipless crankbait. You just tie it in your hand and you just go and you throw it at everything you come by, and eventually you catch some on it. And I just feel like there, our group is training the public that you have to have a bladed jig tied on all the time. I'll be honest with you, I, I'm to the point with it where I'll be glad when they've seen it enough where. They don't want to bite it anymore because somebody, if you watch now, just watch every television show out there, tournament fishing, somebody is throwing a bladed jig every event. Yeah, he's right. He's right. All right, I got to ask this. Did you ever, and when is the last time, if you did throw this, did you ever use a slugger? I crushed him on a slugger. Really? I mean, crushed them on when it first thing when it that's so weird about that because when it first came out or first got popular yeah. i'm like it was like fish would run 25 feet to get it like it was insane how good it was yeah and then they you know then they made a bait called a scissor tail i threw that and then there was uh actually another one that was was a sluggo that had a hole in it you could put a rattle in maybe it was it's a chatterbox or something like that but yeah it and you know and then Honestly, like it seemed like the Cinco style baits and flukes kind of put the slow go out of business. Yeah. Yeah, that was a great bait, though. I remember the black and gold. I mean, everybody around Lake Fork, that you couldn't find a pack of those things 
back in the early 90s and, and kind of mid-90s around Lake Fork and a lot of the lakes uh, in Texas. So uh, that's neat, man. It's, it, it's neat to reflect. I actually uh, found a bag of those black and gold Sluggos a week ago when I was trying to get my stuff ready. And it made me take think it about to Lake that. X. I have not taken it to Lake X. No, I have not. <laughs> you know what we need to do? You need to have a tournament where you just fish baits that were 85 to 95. That would be cool. What do you think about that, Greg? And mono only. So I won't tell you what they are, but I carry a box of baits around and use them quite often, and they help me requalify for the elites this year. And I pretty much caught them on it in every event in all of the Central Opens. And they were all little, really, really strong in the uh, 80s. <laughs> little George? I'm not going to tell you what they are. It's a little George, isn't it? It's a little George. No, it's not. I, I can't tell you that, but I will tell you that, you know, there are some old baits that are still getting it. Wait, hard or soft? Is it a plastic bait or a, 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 a no. winding bait? No, I does, does it have blades? Then you'll get. Or does it I wiggle? Can't tell you that. Yeah, easy, man. Like, easy. Well, I've been, what, yeah. what's the harm in it? Easy, easy, easy. He was burning a little George around the buck brush <laughs> at Louisville. No, he wasn't. <laughs> And they were just coming out and crushing that thing. No, he wasn't. All right. Uh, do you have oh, anything? Hot, hot yeah, there you go. Do you have anything that's in the works with Strike King that might be coming out? I know 2020, a little weird with the whole COVID situation, but are you working on anything for 2021 and maybe beyond? Uh, yeah, there will be a lot of stuff come out, a lot of new stuff in 2021. You know, the lure business was so good in 2020 because of the pandemic because so many people were fishing they were socially distancing and staying away that everybody in the tackle industry rods reels baits whoever you are you know had really had trouble coming out with new stuff because they were really just trying to sell the stuff they already or really make the stuff they already had you know because yeah. the business has been so good hopefully you know hopefully the positive to come from this whole pandemic is that there are a lot of new fishermen or even some that hadn't fished in a long time that went back to fishing during this deal. And uh, I feel like going forward, we will still have those guys, you know. And I know kids that couldn't play sports. They went fishing every day. So I know the pandemic has been bad, but in some ways in our industry, it might have actually been really good for our industry. You know, boat and motor sales are up. Electronics. There's a lot more people on the lake, you know, which is a good thing for us. All right, very nice. Did you watch the national championship game? I did. What are your thoughts? It turned out exactly like I expected it to. <laughs> Were you shocked that you, LSU went 5-5 five and five this year, though? It could have been worse than that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> this, this was the worst LSU team in history. I don't know. They just they seemed like, like they were lost a lot. A lot of great players. Just didn't seem yeah. like they could get it to uh, get it together. So uh, it's not that I like to pull for winners. I, I like after a few games, I became an Alabama fan again. <laughs> oh, geez. Hey, a number of people. Roll, roll tide. There you have it. Uh, a lot of people on the instant feedback and on YouTube want to know uh, about your signature series rod and reel that you have. What can you tell us about it? Uh, so. Well, there, there's a couple. You know, I have a whole line of signature rods at mm -hmm. Academy. And then yeah. we are uh, currently working on the new Lou's signature series. And right. uh, it'll be some more, a little bit of higher end rods, some longer rods, some bigger ones. And, uh, and I'm not the only one. You know, there's a whole group of us that'll have those signature series rods. And, and uh, I have a couple pets in that line coming out soon that uh, I'm really, uh, really impressed with that work really built right and uh so uh but that's actually at a little later date more of that icast period you know how much has your flipping stick changed over the years from the very first time that you w would it have been a quantum 20 years ago that you had i mean like has 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 the rod yeah, that you flip flipping. with and stuff changed uh no not really you know they they basically the biggest thing that's happened in rods is better material you know, they made them lighter, they made them stronger, uh, changed the grips a little. My original flipping stick was telescopic, had a cork handle. And uh, I couldn't tell you the last time I used a rod with a cork handle. 
And, uh, you know, now all my rods come with the wind grips, which I really, really like because it doesn't matter if they're wet, you know, dry, whatever. They just stick to your hand really well. But the action of my flipping stick is exactly the same now as it was at the beginning, hmm. you know, because that I built. So my original flipping stick was built to flip braid with. And uh, the rod I have now is the exact same way. Um, it was built to flip braid with. Uh, you know, I have fluorocarbon rods, and I, I have a fluorocarbon flipping stick, which is actually 7.6. And uh, my braid rod, you can use fluorocarbon on it also. I don't much, but uh, it's 7.11. So I actually have two split. Well, actually, the 7.6 is called a pitching stick, and the 7.11 is the flipping stick, which I pitch with, flip with both of them. But, uh, but yeah, no, not really. Just basically the grips are better, you know, just better components. You know, a fishing line has advanced, tackle has advanced, rod and reels have advanced. You know, they're just better now than they've ever been before, much like our electronics. Our electronics are actually evolving faster than we are. <laughs> you know, I don't know what's next in the, the electronic world, to be honest with you. It's, it's pretty crazy uh, what's going on with the electronic world. I don't know are what's you dialed? next. Basically, it, say that again. Are you dialed in on that? Are you? I mean, are you? Are do you? Are you comfortable saying, "Yeah, I, I know everything it does, and I take advantage of everything it does"? Or do you just? I mean, are you dialed in on the electronics game? Would you say? Uh, I am very dialed in on my electronics game. Yes, I would say that. I More than people realize. That. Yeah, I would think. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I spend more time looking at my depth finders and graphs and live target, and I mean, I I'm pretty much hooked up. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, the last time we had you on, I've actually used this multiple times. I've thought about this section of the interview after disappointing moments in my life because you said that, and and, and I want you to rehash this. Do you remember this, Mark? Where I'm going? I do with this? not. I do not. Oh, we were talking about like pound test and everything, and you said if everything is dialed in, you're not as correct, your your rod action, everything is right, you should never break off 20 pound test on a hook set. It just shouldn't happen. That is correct. It should and not happen. And I, I did that a couple times this year. <laughs> not because of the lie, but obviously like Nick said stuff. I mean, I just wanted to make sure, kind of rehash that because that was amazing to me because I think every one of us at least me, I mean, you'll jack on some fish and if you break off, whether it's a 10 pound test or 25 pound test. And regardless of what type of line you're using and you're like, Oh, you just break off sometimes, but you're like, no, that should never happen. So I, I broke 12 pounds and it was totally me, my fault. And at the, the, the final day at Louisville, I broke off a fish on a worm and it was my fault. I, I, it was 12 pound test and I broke the fish off in a willow tree. And that was that was my fault. But as far in that again, see that was a deal. I should have had fourteen or sixteen, and then I, you know, probably wouldn't have had that issue. And I had been catching them on twenty five, and I leaned on that fish with twelve the same way I've been leaning on them with twenty five. And uh, but other than that, that's the only time I broke my line this year. And I'll be honest with you, I have in the last ten years. I can't fill up one hand with how many times I broke my line in the last 10 years. It just doesn't happen. Wow. And when it does, I, it's typically always my fault. I don't know of a time I've, I've broken my line when I can look back and say, oh, it was the line's fault or whatever. If you use the right equipment for the right situation, you should not break off ever. Not or rod action more important. Uh, as far as not breaking off, or is it a is it, it a whole system? Ah, uh, it's it's probably a combination of both. And not all lines equal. Not, I'm not going to get into that. And you know, I mean, I I use gamma. I tie a mm -hmm. or not, and I don't have any issue. But I don't think honestly, there's another fluorocarbon out there made that you can tie a or not on. It's the reason everybody's gotten away from it. You know, uh, so I can't. You know, I'm not going to get into that deal or whatever, but mm -hmm. it's kind of a combination of both. So it kind of goes back to my flipping and pitching sticks. My 7.6 pitching stick, I will use 20 on. And if I'm casting, I actually use 16 on it. Like I love 16 gam. I'm out fishing deep, dragging a jig or big worm around, swim bait or stuff. And I, if I'm casting, but when I'm actually pitching with it, you know, up close and all, I'll use 20. 
but I wouldn't use lighter than that because then I it starts the rod starts to be too much for the line. So you kind of you know that's the deal. Every time you drop poundage, you need to drop the action of the rod, and the rod needs to be softer. You know, because really, what you in a perfect world, if you got the right rod for the application, you can still lean on them the same way. If you don't have too much rod, mm-hmm. does that if that makes sense? So you don't really have the rod to compensates. Yeah, the rod compensates for it. So it's just, you know, I use a my, my seven six rods got a fairly soft tip on it, and I just I can. I can lean on them with 20 with it, but I, but like I said, when I go to 16, I got to be casting it. I can't catch them up close with it. I would be afraid I would break the line. So I go down in rods and also by using a shorter rod, you can't put as much pressure on the fish. So a lot of times when I am like, you know, finesse jig on 12 or what, cause I don't hardly ever throw a finesse jig on lighter than 12. And uh, I like a seven foot rod for that. And again, by going to that smaller rod, you're less apt to break the line, you know, Hey, a lot of people want to know what's the biggest bass that you've ever caught, competition or non-competition. Uh, well, the the biggest non-competition bass I ever caught was a twelve eight. I caught it out of the Arkansas River. Uh, I grew up on the lower end of the Arkansas River, and uh, there, I mean there, that that pool where I grew up at produced three over fifteen pounds. Like it, it was full of giants when I was growing up. I grew up in a great place. I mean, where there were 35 fish, 30 pound bags. And I mean, it was a, and, uh, but the biggest tournament fish I ever caught was 11, 11. And I caught it that I am stead in a Bassmaster. And that same year I caught 11, seven out of Falcon. And when I won the East West fish off, I actually caught yeah. a 11, seven and a 10, three the same day. But, but, you know, now it seems like you got to go to those super lakes to catch a fish like that. And I caught, so I think I've weighed three tens at Palatka. So I look forward to going back there for our first elite series. Because <laughs> um, I caught a couple of giants there. It's a great place, too, to catch big ones. All right. I'm trying to find this question, Matt. I am, too. <laughs> We're both too. He's it. like, should I post it a third time? I don't know what it is. I don't either. We're looking at questions on the uh, on the feed, Greg. Uh, yeah, I don't know what it is. I didn't. I didn't see it. I mean, obviously, we can't get to every single question, but we try to get to ones that have been asked multiple times during the show. So, uh, do you use mono at all anymore? Uh, I still throw a topwater bait on mono, and I still throw a bladed jig some on mono. If I have an issue where those fish are biting that bladed jig funny, and the hookups not doesn't seem like I'm missing some, seems like I'm pulling it away from them. I'll just tie it on twenty pound mono. You'll catch every one of them. Just because of the stretch gives you a little bit more time? or Well, the deal is that they, it gives them a chance to engulf that bait before you know it. So a lot of times our equipment's so good, we react too quick. So by going to mono, it, it, it actually does two things. It gives that fish a chance to engulf that bait. And then the other deal is when you react, that line has enough stretch in it that you won't pop that blade open for a chance for them to come off. The big thing is is to make sure they get it. It's the same reason for cranking with a – a composite rod and not cranking with a graphite rod. It's to slow down your reaction time. You so know, if you're, you're throwing a more carbon bladed jig and boom, you get one, a couple cranks in and it pops off or you get one and it, it jumps off or you get one and it's hooked kind of slap, like it's slapping it on the outside of the face. You'll go, man, they're not choking it today. Put that rod down, pick up one with mono because you know, they're still getting them to react to that bait. And then, they'll have it and hooked better catch every one of them and really the the, the deal is when that to <laughs> me that really uh when that really works is when those fish are extremely shallow you'll be you'll be they'll get it and cut the line and run sideways and come off everybody who's thrown a bladed jig has had this issue i see i Wait. see pros have it on uh, watching you know them losing fish missing 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 i just uh seven foot medium heavy rod with 20 pound mono catch every one of them so we have a small, uh, not a small lake, Keystone in Oklahoma. Yeah. You catch yeah. the majority yeah. of your fish. I mean, it's ridiculously good chatterbait lake. Most of them come in a foot to two and a half feet of water. Like, I mean, you're like, how the heck was that? I mean, he had to be laying on his side. But you'll have them boil when they eat it, rip five or six feet to the freaking right, and you're like, big and big and big and boom, and then he's gone. <laughs> and I always thought it was because they were trying to, to 
like roll or pin the bait on the bottom. They couldn't really engulf it because of how shallow it was. You think, or not think, you know, you're Greg Hackney, that mono could be the solution to my problems. You have to give it a try. <laughs> there you go, man. All right, I found the I found the question. Uh, he wants to know your jig trailer. What is your preference, big and bulky or smaller and compact? Uh, well, that depends on my number one jig trailer is a Strike King Rage Crawl. I probably use that ninety percent of the time. Uh, in situations where the water, I still want a big profile, but I don't want all that action. I just go to a KVD chunk the senior the big one which is basically the rabbit ears and then you know situations where i downsize my jig i'll use a baby rage crawl or either use that baby uh that baby chunk i, I but i, I just kind of look at the situation look at the water temperature look at the fishing pressure you got to take all that in but like a but 90 percent of the time i like if i'm flipping a full size jig i got a rage crawl in the back of it that would be my number one trailer choice and has been for it gets more bites. It just seems like I got more bites, and I get jig bites in situations where it's hard to get a jig bite. And that's what really sold me on the rage crawl. And uh, it really slows down the rate of fall. You're able to throw a heavier jig and get the same rate of fall as you would have a light one, which makes you more efficient. And uh, like in situations before where I would have to throw a 3 eighths, now I can throw a half because that rage crawl slows down the rate of fall so much. And, uh, and a half ounce jig just casts better, and it works around cover better. So there are there are, you know reasons for the rage crawl being my choice, and I mean it's my number one choice on a swim jig. I just I love that rage crawl. All right, very nice. A number of people want to know what event this year that you're looking forward to the most. You know, I, I would probably have to say the first one, and it doesn't have anything to do with location. It just I guess I'm like Christy. I got to get rid of these jitters and uh, get into that first one. And to me, like, you know, this year going back on the elites is getting back to normal, if that makes sense, like the practice and just getting back in the, you know, I guess it's, it is kind of like what Christy said in his post yesterday is getting back in the groove. I look forward to having this opportunity of getting back in the groove. And uh, yeah. so I'm looking forward to all of them, but the first one just to do it. You know what I mean? So how about yeah. this? This has been three years since I fished an Elite Series event. So it is kind of a new deal in a way. You know what I mean? Like, it'll be the new normal. <laughs> Does it seem like, I mean, you say it like that in three years, you're like, holy cow, it just seems like yesterday yeah. that all this stuff i mean does it seem like it's been a long time does it seem like it's just been a month like i mean because to us it's just like i just heard that and was like holy cow that's been three years already it's hard to believe it uh you you know i can tell you one thing it has taught me no don't take anything for granted <laughs> you know what i mean i i don't know i i didn't know you know i didn't know when i left if i'd if i'd never go back or if i'd miss it at all you know, what is that deal where you release something and if it comes back to you, you know, it's supposed to be. And that's that's kind of that deal I'm in. You know what I mean? Like, um, I was very proud to go back and to requalify for the elites, you know, through the opens. And uh, it's the same way I got in originally. So <laughs> I, it did kind of make me nervous to have to do it a second time. I'm glad it turned out like it did. But it is it is different. You know what I mean? I do have a different feeling about this year. I'm not taking anything for granted anymore. I feel like maybe I did that a little bit in the past. I will not do that anymore. Interesting. Uh, does Greg Hackney feel pressure? Did you feel any type of pressure last year uh, when you were fishing the Opens to try and get yourself in a position that you wanted to be in? Yes, I felt a ton of pressure. Really? You know, because I because you know the deal was, I don't know. I, you know, I had the exemption, but I don't know that they would have honored it because I didn't come mm -hmm. back after one season. I came back after two, so I could mm -hmm. not take a chance on that situation. You know what I mean? I didn't want to be at the end of the, and I put all my eggs in that basket because I had already the I I did not re-sign up for Major League Fishing or the Bass Pro Tour or whatever, and mm -hmm. so and that was before Lewis. So going into that final tournament, I didn't have a choice. I had to make it or I would spend the year fishing the Opens this year. And I did not want to do that. You know, I wanted to get back in the elites. And uh, 
So yeah, I probably had by far had more pressure on myself this year qualifying for the elites than I did the first time I qualified for them. Because you got to understand, the first time I fished, I actually qualified for the Bassmaster, and I was fishing FLW, and I didn't even I didn't take the qualification. It was a I actually fished the opens. I actually qualified for like three times in a row before I ever decided to fish bass. Now you're uh, showing because, off. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm just saying that <laughs> it just never was that kind of pressure because I always, I just try, I fished the opens to make the classic. That's how I started. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And because uh, I was fishing FLW full time. And then, you know, I'll be honest with you, you know, because it was expensive to fish two tournament trails. And then finally I finished third in the open championship and they paid my entry fees into the, in the Bassmaster. And that's how I got in. That's the year I decided to go and I, they paid for it. They paid my entry fees. It, John Murray won. The, uh, we were at uh, Toledo Bend, and I finished third. John Murray won at the Open Championship, and uh, they paid my entry fees that next year. And it was, and that was would have been in 2004, my rookie season, and I won the Rookie of the Year that year. And uh, Bassmaster paid my entry fees. Wow. Hmm. Did you talk with uh, Peroznik and Atkins and Christie? I mean, there were a number. I mean, it was public info because the MLF came out with their list of guys who were fishing the BPT, and your names weren't on it. So we were like, okay, th- these guys have all their eggs in the basket. Like, did you guys see each other at the Opens and be like, hey, you're in the same boat I'm in? We did. <laughs> we talked about it. I, I, I pretty much knew because Christy, I felt like Christy was going to make it in on the overall because he had fished them all. And uh, so uh, I knew what his plan, you know, knew what his plan was. And, uh, but like uh, Jacob, we, you know, we talked a good bit. And so he was in the same situation I was. We had to make it in the Centrals. And then, of course, Justin was also fishing, you know, both, you know, the whole series or whatever. So that gave them an opportunity to make it in. That actually give them three ways to make it in. You know, they could qualify three mm-hmm. different ways. And so, uh, Prosnick and I, we only had the one opportunity to get in through the Central. So uh, it was all in. You know what I mean? It was all in. But my wife has always said I felt fish better under pressure, but I hate pressure. <laughs> but I had plenty of it. All right, an interesting question on the instant feedback. Jake in Ohio wants to know, what was Mark Zona's reaction uh, when you were coming back to the Bassmaster Elite Series? What did he say to you? Did you guys talk? What's the scoop on that, Greg? Well, we started talking. We we talk about once a week. <laughs> so we were talking way before I ever even signed up for the Opens, uh, you know, this year. And uh, I actually called him and got uh, Bruce Aiken's phone number just to see if I could get any opens. Because, you know, that's another thing about the pandemic. You know, had it not been for that, I wouldn't have been able to requalify for the elites this year. Because what happened, they moved the tournament at Louisville to November. It was supposed to have been in April, and I would have had to miss it. So because of that, that's the only reason I was even able to fish the opens. So, wow. uh, yeah, he was excited. He was behind me all the way on that deal. You know, we're, you know, I, we're, we're very close friends. So, uh, we talk a lot, you know, we talked a lot about that deal and, uh, you know, he'd been wanting me to come back since year one. And, uh, and you know, another thing that was, there was a huge fine if I'd have left, you know, it was almost a $50,000 fine to leave major league fishing and fish mm-hmm. any other tournament trail. So that was another thing that came with the pandemic. So after the pandemic, they uh, got rid of our contracts. So when they got rid of our contracts, there was no fine anymore. So that was the other thing that opened it up for me to be able to go back to Bass and not have to pay Major League Fishing $50,000. Mm-hmm. Because the first couple guys that left did pay some fine. I don't know if they ended up paying all of it, but they did pay some. You know, that I'm 100% sure of that. So uh, mm-hmm. I really didn't want to pay them that. You know what I mean? I mean, that's a lot of money. And uh, – so it just worked out. I mean, this everything worked out, you know, this year. And a lot of, of it is because of COVID-19. I hate to say that, but, you know, I guess I made the advantage. Of, I mean, you know, made the best out of a bad situation. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. A uh, number of people want to know, what boat are you running this year? What model? Uh, I'm, running a seven, I'm running a Phoenix 721. Uh, you know, I kind of picked my boat by the schedule. And there's just – it looks – there's several – 
uh, venues this year on the Elite Series where it looks like I might have to make a long boat ride or possibly could, you know, run 40 mm-hmm. to 70 miles. And uh, and that's the boat I just feel the best about doing that in. That's, you know, that's my original Phoenix boat was a 721. I think this is – I've been with Phoenix now for 11 years. This will be my 11th season with Phoenix. And uh, all their boats are great boats, and I've liked them all. But that 721 has just been – always been my favorite you know it's uh it's it's a great big water boat it runs like a rocket i just i like it (laughs) did it have the heated seats running this year it has heated Uh, seats right uh, my my boat doesn't have the heated seats no heated well i guess technically it 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 it, i it does have the heated seat when i'm sitting in it i thought (laughs) and this could have been a joke of me I thought the, that they had heated seats. They do. I did not get that on my particular boat. See, that's an option. Is okay. it? It's seriously an option, is it not? It, it it is an option. Yes. Why didn't you not go with the heated seats, Greg? Because uh, I, 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 I I don't know. I guess because I feel like I got a hot ass. That's the line of the year so far right there, Matthew. That's good stuff. <laughs> hey, uh, Dave wants to know, can you say anything about uh, – supposedly there was a prototype that was being uh, ran last year. Do you know anything about that that you can say? A prototype. Uh, Gary, yeah, Gary was running it. Like a boat? Yeah. A prototype Phoenix. Do you know anything about that? Uh, you know the deal is that's classified. Okay. <laughs> there you have it, Dave. It's classified, so uh, can't it's talk about that. Up Air, whenever they open up Area Fifty One, you'll get to see it. <laughs> just be, just be Gary Klaus just standing there with his arms open, just a fleet of phoenixes behind him. <laughs> that's pretty good, Panger. That's pretty good. All right, Greg, uh, man, we've kept you for almost uh, 90 minutes here, and I greatly appreciate you taking time out. I have one last question, Matthew. You have anything else? No, I've, we've, I, I'm done after the, after the heated seats. <laughs> that, knocked me out of, that knocked me out for the day. All right, I want to know, I want to know, and, and some people are going to kill me for asking this, but I don't care. Uh, if, if it was you versus Mark Zona, in a one-on-one basketball game to 10, who wins? Oh, wow. I, c- I could see that going either way, honestly. Because I don't feel like either one of us is worth a flip at basketball. <laughs> <laughs> that's, why, that's what would make it so great to the re- see. The reconstructive surgeon and the, the knee surgeon is the one who wins that one. Yeah, that 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 is not going to go well. It'll be funny. It'll be entertaining, but it's not going to Oh, I'm go sure well. it would be. We may have to live stream that one, man, and have a doctor on call. The medevac company is the one who wins that one. <laughs> well, seriously, health wise, you I okay? You were gonna say like a, oh yeah, me? Yeah. Uh, I, I guess I'm feeling All right. pretty spunky. All right. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought. No, what were you gonna say? Uh, I was thinking more like I would rather be in a wrestling match with Mark Zona. Oh, who wins it? Who wins a chess match? Like a battle of the wits. I win that. Huh? You a good chess player, Greg? I mean, I'm a professional gambler. What do you think? <laughs> He's pretty good. I, 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 I've been watching that show called The Queen's Gambit, which yeah. is about the uh, the savant yeah, chess that's pretty, yeah. girl. Yeah, that's pretty, yeah, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's a pretty awesome Have you been show. watching that too? Yes, my wife is really into it. That's a good she one. Loves it. it is a good one. The other it one is, that I is got is into is uh, Cobra Kai. What? <laughs> I don't. That, I don't know about that one. My my nine year old daughter is into that one. <laughs> it's no, it's the Karate Kid. Thirty years later, they come back after the Karate yeah, Kid, I'm, and it's the guy who got I'm kicked in the joking. face, and the dude who crane kicked him, and one of them's a car salesman, and the other one's. Figuring his way through life, I, and the rivalry is reunited, and it's three wonderful seasons of it. Uh, have at it, man! I don't know about that one. I, I just Hackney wish took, I a, took a shot. I, no, I didn't. I, honestly, my my uh, my nine year old daughter loves it. <laughs> I, uh, 
I'm thinking I should have bought stock in Netflix before the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. The, the streaming deal is unbelievable. Yeah. 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 Steve Ranella got in on that because he's got his net. That's a Netflix original, yes. isn't it? Meat Eater? Yes, it, yes, it that is. stuff's phenomenal. It is yeah, phenomenal. That, I really like that it, is, though. Yeah, the Meat Eater show is the number one podcast in America in the wilderness. They've category. got like the first top six. Yeah. And all their their variations. Yeah. Yeah, that's good stuff. All right, Greg, you know, man. Funny, it, yeah, it go ahead. It took him a while to get started. You know, he tried his show on, on, on national television once before, and it didn't go. Then he was on the Outdoor Channel, Sportsman's Channel, and it just – and I liked it from the beginning. This has been years ago <laughs> when he started. And then now all of a sudden it's – I think – with the way the world's changing that, you know, it'd be cool now to be able to live off the land. And that's cool now. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. people see that as being, being able to sustain themselves, you know, with, mm -hmm. so I just think that's, what's made it popular, but it, I, it I took think him it's, a while it's genuine. To get to it's the same at. reason why yeah. people love you and Zona together. It's genuine. Yeah. You're having fun. I mean, it's why the, that, that his shows when you're on it, it's the same thing with their no. I mean, and, and I don't know him personally, I've never met him, but it just comes across as extremely genuine. Like he cares about the yeah, resource, he cares about the animals, he cares about the experience. Yeah. If he shoots one, misses one, and doesn't find it, there's a show of him shooting one and not finding it. Yeah, yeah. And I think people it's appreciate real. that. Yep. To some point, it's our BTL podcast too, Mark. <laughs> I don't know about that. Anyway, Greg, man, best of luck to you this season. I know a lot of fans out there are very excited to see you out there on the elite series this year and uh wish you nothing but the best this year man yeah thank y'all enjoy being on here every time appreciate the opportunity. yeah all right man take care greg all right see you all right there you have it greg hackney great interview great dude you're barking up the wrong tree with one of them questions there mark which one the secret top secret area 51 oh, questions yeah. well dave wanted to know dave's a I long time you. You're Long time viewer. Ask it what the people want to know. Try to give the people what they want. Anyway, uh, some interesting response, responses there by Greg. And uh, apologize. Did you know what was happening with his mic? It was Could rubbing up against his hoodie. collar. His hoodie. I don't know. Yeah, that's what it was. So uh, it was good. The, the re it, 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 I mean, it is what it is. And, you know, sometimes you just get those kind of situations, but. Uh, Nevertheless, a great, great uh, interview with uh, one of the superstars in the game. You not agree with that? Yeah, I mean, he's been a superstar now, what would you say, for... Long time. 15 to 20, 15 years? Yeah. Do you think the iconic moment for him was the uh, rip-rap catch? The Godzilla fish made him yeah. a superstar. Yeah. It really did, and that would have been 2006. That's 15 years. Yeah. Um... And he and I also think I mean, dude, the guy remains relevant. Very rarely does he go stretches of time without a big win, regardless of what organization it is. Yeah, I this is kind of a ridiculous question, and we don't know. But if you had to put the odds on him winning a blue trophy this year, what would you put him at? Uh, I was looking at the I was looking at the schedule. Um. You gonna bet against him at the St. Johns River? No. I mean, the Tennessee River. He does not like to fish in the cold. Yeah. And that's February twenty fifth through twenty eighth. Yeah. Uh, you you gonna bet against him in the in, the, in uh, Pickwick? No. That they change for the Classic that no. time of the year. <laughs> you want to bet against him at the Sabine River in April, where he blew the field away last time? No. Uh. You want to bet against him on Lake Fork in, 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 in the end of April? Okay, so I'm just going to throw some odds out there. Do you? I mean, no, seriously, go down it. Yeah. No, uh, Neely Henry in May? I don't know. I know Neely Henry pretty good, and he gets the largemouth bite going there. Yeah. He could catch him there. Yeah. Uh, Gunnersville? I wouldn't bet against him at Gunnersville no. in May. And then no. you go up north, and we've seen what he's done in Cayuga in the past. So he'll have a top 10 at Champlain. Uh, he's one of the few guys who was cast to check him and, and John Murray, and I think maybe ish fishing for largemouth on the St. Lawrence. But I, I mean, it would probably be a surprise if he came in with 110 pounds of smallmouth. Yeah. But I wouldn't put it past him. Yeah. So I mean, though he said he didn't think that the schedule was 
perfect for him and he was really looking forward to Florida, but you go down that list and I could see Hackney. Four to one? Yeah. Four to one? It's hard to win these. I mean, also, I mean, look at, uh, yeah, that's four to one still. I mean, not saying anything against Hackney, but I mean, four to one is really good odds to win one. I mean, you're talking, Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get back to, get back to how many here. This would be easier. (laughs) What are you looking at? Well, I mean, you give it four to one, and yeah, I mean, it seems, how does he not win one of those with Greg Hackney? But then you look at the rest of the field, and you also have to understand, in 187 Bass tournaments with Bass, he's only won six times. Yeah. So even the very best guys, like I said, KVD, when when he left, and those stats are kind of getting skewed now, was just under 13%. Mm-hmm. So that's what, 10 to one, 9 to one? Field was a lot different then. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. I'm not taking anything away from from what is currently out yeah, there. You had I, a lot more guys that had the same knowledge and experience on the bodies of water that they were going to because you take that the whole Hackney generation, Edwin, Kevin's generation, and then yeah. that whole generation before, and they all kind of grew up with the same info, the same experience, the same number of tournaments on those fisheries. And then with this shakeup, you end up with guys with a lot of experience and a lot of guys with no experience yeah. and then a bunch of guys with intermittent experience. So going back to it, yeah, he's going to have a lot more experience and a lot more wins and been in a lot more situations than a lot of those yeah. guys. Would you be intimidated by him on the water? I, like if I pull into an area and there's a boat there, I mean, I would prefer for it not to be Greg Hackney. Or if, <laughs> if someone pulls into my area, I would not get intimidated at all. Because yeah. I've covered, the, the, I've seen so many, I've talked to guys so many. I mean, I believe that I know. What if you were a rookie on the Elite Series and that situation occurs? Are you intimidated? It, just, it depends on the, it depends on the, uh, <laughs> on the guy. But I'm just saying, I yeah. would not be intimidated because I feel like being immersed in the sport for as long as I have, if we were happened to be in the same spot at the same time in the Bassmaster Opens, I would yeah. know how to handle it. Yeah. I mean, it, whether it was, I would know that I was doing what I felt was the right thing to do. And obviously, you, Hackney would do the right thing. Do you not agree? It doesn't matter if you're a rookie, a two-year guy, whatever it is. Communication is the best way to get through that type of situation. Bar none. worst thing yeah. you can do is ignore the guy. The yeah. worst thing you can do is go after the guy. Well, you told yeah. me, I still live by it. If it crosses your mind that it's the wrong thing to do, don't do it. Exactly. I had it on, on, on day one of the Open on the Arkansas River. There was a guy at the mouth of a slough, and I knew it was a two-boat slough, but I had to go past the guy to get to my stretch of the slough on the right-hand side. Yeah. And I, it never crossed my mind. I said, I'm going to go to the back, and, 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 and he was not happy with me <laughs> at all and let me know it. And I said, dude, I said, I'm going right back here, and I'm fishing that. And I said, I'm not fishing your side. And I said, you got 200 yards down here. There's 120 boats that lock through, and there's eight sloughs in this whole freaking pool. So yeah. I'm fishing that right-hand side of the slough. Yeah. But if it had crossed my mind, like, oh, I wonder if I should go in there. If that's not the right, not the right thing to do, don't do it. That's good stuff, man. Hackney's great. Yep. He's always great. I would like to see that one-on-one between him and Zona, though. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that would be a good charity thing. I don't know if I can swing that, get that set up or not. Maybe play to, what, two? <laughs> I mean, I think it'd be a very physical. There'd be a lot of layups. They'd back each other down. Don't you agree? Yeah. Like, it would be... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, That's an interesting text. Get to that tomorrow. Good or bad? Good. Frank Scalish, tomorrow, day four. Show number two of day four. And uh, we'll see what Frank has in store for us tomorrow. The feedback has been awesome. And uh, can't thank Frank enough for taking part in this day four thing. So uh, don't forget, next week, Jason Christie, Kevin Van Dam, and Carl Jakobsen. It's a good lineup. Pretty jammed week next week. All right, everybody, be safe. That's it. Day four tomorrow. We're out of here.